Okay, we're going to start going over chapter 9, which is all about chemical names and their formulas. So let's start with section 1 about naming ions. So we're talking about atoms and ions, and it's really important for you to know the difference between an atom and an ion. All atoms are going to be neutral, okay, because what it is is they have the same number of protons and electrons. So we have no loss or gain of electrons, meaning we have no charge. Now, if we do have a loss or a gain of electrons, we have ions because they show us there is a different number of protons and electrons. Now, when we go into monoatomic ions, okay, this consists of a single atom with a positive or negative charge resulting from the loss or gain of one or more valence electrons, respectively, okay? So only electrons are the ones that are going to be moving, okay? We're not going to be moving protons, okay? So the gain or a loss of an electron is going to cause that positive or negative charge. Okay, now we've gone over this before, so I'm going to go through this kind of quickly, but anions um, all have negative charges. They have a negative charge because they're gaining uh, electrons. A majority of the time, they are nonmetals. Okay, and some examples are going to be F minus. Okay, now I have the one here, but we all know, right, that we do not need to show the ones in chemistry, okay? But this is just this for the sake of you seeing that we lose one electron, okay? And another example would be O2 minus. Now on the flip side, we have cations, which are the opposite of that. So they have positive charges. They're formed because they lose electrons, okay? There are um, more protons than electrons, which is why we have that positive charge, okay? Uh, cations are majority metals. Okay, now again, when we're talking about the groups on the periodic table, if we have group one, we have lost an electron, so we have a charge of positive one. Group two has a positive two charge. Group three has a positive three charge. Now group four has a positive four charge, but many times, and you're going to see when we talk about some of the exceptions to the rules, that a lot of our group four ions um, tend to share their electrons. Group 5 has negative 3, 6 is negative 2, 7 is negative 1, and 8 has no charge, okay? Um, now, looking back, if you notice, they all say A after, okay? So we're jumping from group 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A, okay? So remember, we're only going to be talking about group A. Now, our group B elements are our transition elements, and many of these use Roman numerals to show their charges because they can vary. Copper, for example, could have a charge of 1, 2, or 3. Iron is another example and could have a charge of 2 or 3. So that 2 right here, the Roman numeral 2 tells us that we have a charge of plus 2. Roman, Roman numeral 3 shows us here for this iron, it has a charge of plus 3. Okay, so when we are naming our um, cations, um, many times we have two different methods. There's the stock system and the classical method. So our stock system is the one that we see here in which we're using the Roman numerals. Then there's the classical method, which we use suffixes. Now, you don't always know the true value when we're using the classical method. Now, um, when we're using the stock um, system, so cations, if the charge is always the same, just write the name of the metal. And transition metals can be more than one charge. So again, this is kind of the review of the stuff we've seen before. Um, table 9.2, which we see here, is going to show you a lot of our transition metal charge possibilities. Okay? Now, we have these post-transition elements that could differ as well. Okay, so we have tin and we have lead, which are both in group four. But if you notice here, they can have either a charge of two or four. And they follow the same rule as um, showing the Roman numerals, okay, to tell you exactly what charge it's there. So m most times, tin and lead are going to show you what that oxidative state is, which is um, the charge by the Roman numerals. Now, we also have exceptions to the rules when it comes to the transition elements in which these particular elements have a set charge, okay? And this would be really, really important for you to write down. Now, silver always has a charge of plus one, zinc has a charge of plus two, and cadmium has a charge of plus two as well. 
Okay. Now, when we're going into naming the anions, they always have the same charge, okay? And many times, they're going to end with the term "-ide", okay? And we've seen this before as well. So, example, fluorine would actually be called a fluoride ion, okay? And lastly are our polyatomic ions, okay? Polyatomic, meaning we have multiple atoms making up a compound already, okay? And so these are groups of atoms that stay together and have an overall charge and one name. So we have C2H3O2 minus, okay? It's an ion because we still have that charge at the very, very end, okay? And it's polyatomic because we have many different atoms, okay? And um, you guys all have this paper, but 9.3 also gives you kind of the breakdown of our polyatomic ions. Okay, so that's the end of section one, and I'm going to actually jump right into section two, okay? So, section two is all about naming and writing formulas for ionic compounds. Now, at this time on your paper, I want you to write in the margin next to number one. Again, in the margin, I want you to draw three stars, okay? And you'll see why I told you to do that in class, okay? So the first thing is, what is a binary compound? A binary compound is, okay, if we look, it says bi, so it means two. We have two different elements. They can be ionic or molecular, and they're going to form a compound. And a lot of times when we're looking at our binary ionic compounds, you're going to put the cation first. Remember, we're going to put our metals first. Then you're going to put the anion at the end. Now, so here's um, an example of how to write an ionic compound, okay? And you should have seen this before, but I'm going to explain it again. So, our example is going to be barium nitrate, okay? So, we have barium, which is Ba2+, and then we have nitrate, which is Na3-. So, you're going to write the formulas of the cation, which is here, and the anion, and we're going to include those charges. They're really, really important. So you're going to check to see if the charges are balanced. Now we have a plus 2 and a minus 1, meaning they are not balanced, okay? So balanced charges, if um, necessary, are you're going to be done by using subscripts, okay? So use parentheses if you need more than one of the polyatomic ions, and use the crisscross method to balance subscripts. So since we have a positive 2 here and a negative 1, we're going to flip-flop or crisscross, and it's going to, this 2, which came from the barium, and this invisible 1, which came from the nitrate, are going to cause you to have this compound. So it's BaNO3 with the 2 on the outside. Now these parentheses are very, very important because this 2 needs to apply to both to the nitrogen and the oxygen, not just to one piece. Okay? Here is just another example using ammonium sulfate. We have a positive charge from ammonia. We have a negative two charge from sulfate. Okay, they are not balanced. So we're going to have to do the crisscross method. Okay, so that's why this two goes here. Okay, and then this invisible one goes here. Since the one goes here, we don't need to put this in parentheses. Okay. Now, when we're naming our ionic compounds, you're going to name, again, the cation first, then the anion. So monoatomic cations are going to just be the name of the element. So if we just have one cation by itself, we're going to have, for example, calcium ion. We don't need to change anything in the name. However, if we are going to change a monoatomic anion, this is where it gets different, okay? We add the IDE. Now, we may be drilling and killing this in your brain, but I hope now you see the difference between um, when we have the cation and anion by itself. So cations, again, we just go by the name and say at, um, ion at the end. For an anion, we're going to say the actual root of the name, then we change it to IDE, okay? So that's why we have calcium chloride, okay? Um, when we are naming our ionic compounds using the Roman numerals, it's the same exact idea. If we have lead 2 chloride, okay, it's going to be PbCl2. The 2 came from the lead, and Cl has a minus 1 charge, so here is a negative, or uh, just an invisible 1. Okay, so these are three things that we're looking for for naming ionic compounds. So the first, if cations have parentheses, the number in the parentheses is their actual charge. Okay, so it's that whole flip-flop again. If anions end in IDE, they are probably off the periodic table, meaning 
it's just the monoatomic um, anion. If anions end in ATE or ITE, then it is polyatomic, meaning it's bonded with something else. Okay, good job. So you've gotten through the first two sections of chapter nine.